Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Forecast is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Forecast is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly, all streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30 day trial, go to Netflix.com slash twit. What sort of future do you think we're heading for? How will we live as we slip into the 21st century? Welcome to Forecast, episode 108, the same number of stitches that are in a baseball. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm Scott Johnson, and that's a weird thing to know, Tom. I'm impressed. You know, I used to subscribe to a magazine called 108, and it was about baseball, mm. and that's how I remember I, that. Oh, really? That, yeah. I, I love it when, uh, like, Wired's a good example of it. I like a magazine that is about a thing or about a kind of thing. But digs real deep for the reference for their name. That's, yeah, that's kind of not awesome. like good housekeeping where it's like, well, now we know what that's about. And, you know. <laughs> sure. <laughs> or twenty like twenty six hundred is a good example of what you're talking about. Yeah, uh, that's true. Joining us today on Forecast, uh, very happy to have Nicole S. Young, a food and lifestyle photographer, author with Peach Pit Press and Craft and Vision, help desk specialist with the National Association of Photoshop Professionals. Wow, you're busy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Nicole. Thanks, Tom. And uh, also back on the show, Glenn Rubenstein, producer and co-host of Shut Up and Play, uh, right here on the Twit Network, our weekly LAN party. Spreecaster. Yes. Uh, a recent phenomenon. Yes. It's uh, quite enjoyable. And former writer and director and producer on Lonely Girl 15, creator of the video series Red Earth 88 and Op Aphid. Very good. You've, you've, you've read it's my as Wikipedia if page. I've read it right off of Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Glenn. <laughs> Thank let's, you, uh, Let's start off with the uh, first of our four segments, predictions from listeners. I kind of wish we had, now I kind of wish we had uh, um, transitions for this. 108 episodes there. in, and I finally wish oh, we... Tell Jason to, Jason to get on the stick. He's got nothing going on. He Jason doesn't make any stuff. We always get listeners making that stuff. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. All right. But we can't require it because I'm cheap. Uh, John writes in and says, in the future, everyone will have Z Corp printers or maker bots at home to print out anything that they need. All the manufacturing companies would have to go out of business. And the only businesses that make money are selling original designs to download to your home printer. However, I do not believe in the Star Trek replicators that will produce things directly from energy. These machines will have to have raw materials from which they will assemble their products. Perhaps some polymer, some glass, some aluminum, etc. Therefore, UPS will still have a business in delivering raw materials to people's houses to feed the machines. And other companies will still be in business creating those raw materials. Interesting. So we will we will boil down the business of making stuff to design raw materials and then us. This feels like this is like real life Minecraft. And I've been playing a lot of Minecraft <laughs> lately, Tom. So Obviously. I can't speak to this. I've been playing on a server and it's been on my mind. And um, the game is pretty good at sort of simulating the idea that if we were on our own with a stick in our hand and really nothing else, uh, we could go and sort of, you know, make our way, survive zombies at night, build little huts, make uh, torches, eventually make swords to fight off the bad guys, eventually build great cities, uh, you know, in a memorandum of our great people that have come before. And I wish it were all truly that simple. There's not a lot of misery or suffering in that game. But a world where we make everything. So it's no longer, oh, I love that brand of whatever, TV or or T or, or whatever it is with a T in it, <laughs> apparently. But we, when we move away from that and we move into, I love the thing that so-and-so designed and therefore I'm going to make, you know, three couches and a love seat based on that. As a, that's a strange future. Feels a long way off, but not that, not that crazy to me, given some of the technology we're seeing uh, starting to crop up in its infancy today. Nicole, do you have any uh, any insight in the future of printing things? Are you into maker bots or any of that kind of stuff? I no, I, I'm re- I, I mean, I follow. I'm following what you guys are saying because I'm really familiar with Star Trek and the replicator aspect of things. <laughs> but with as far as raw materials, what kind of raw materials are we going to actually have to have? Are we going to have to have like thousands and thousands of different things and end up, you know, spending money on all these things and we're only using like a tiny bit of them? Like if we want toothpaste, obviously there are certain compounds that go into toothpaste that you aren't going to create anything else with or very few other things with. So it seems somewhat far-fetched, but, I, you know, 
I think we all like the possibility of have everything created from energy, like on Star Trek. But I think it's very possible that they could do something along those lines. Yeah, no, so it'd it's have a, to be. It, it'd be a lot like you know, Back to the Future. We'd have to come up with a way of of destroying what we already have. I think this even came up on a previous show. So to make that couch, I want to make. Uh, there's a good chance that I could replenish a lot of the, the base materials that I need. And maybe all I need is inks and dyes or something. But by feeding my existing couch into some sort of, you know, grinder, I don't know what. I don't know what would eat the couch. But whatever it is, could convert that leather and that foam and that stuffing or whatever is part of this of this couch, the wood frame, and use those again as raw materials. That, I think, is the utopian ideal, Tom, that we could end up, you know, just reusing and then remaking based on what we've already got. The way the MakerBot works right now, you you buy spools of, of a polymer resin type thing that feeds into the, the MakerBot and it uses that to print. So there's not any leftovers. Uh, you know, you're not wasting material. But, but you're right. You make a really good point, Nicole, that there's lots of products that we wouldn't print. It's only good for certain things. We wouldn't print toothpaste. We wouldn't print a hamburger. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that with, the, with the 3D printing technology... We could print tables, we could print couches and, and potentially reuse them, but we'd, we would need printers that are able to handle multiples of types of material. Now, the MakerBot can do that. It can do some metal as well as the polymer, uh, and, it, and it's going to be able to do a wider variety of things in the future. But I still wonder if that will... I mean, we, we don't make all our own music now that we have <laughs> the ability to record music. I mean, I still think that there might be a need for somebody who makes something really good rather than just sort of a pre-printed design. Well, I think what's interesting is what does this do to the world economy? So in the U.S., we've seen all these manufacturing jobs go overseas to China and India, uh, you know, and, uh, poorer countries, uh, which in turn has been a huge boom for their economies, driving up demand, money flowing back to America for some goods, but not manufactured goods. But what does this do in the sense that, you know, of course you could have the idea of a royalty fee. You know, it really changes the complete uh, dynamics of manufacturing when you think about it for a lot of items, when you could essentially pay a royalty fee, download a design, and then print it out using a raw materials. Of course, then there'll be hacked 3D printers where, you know, you can uh, use pirated designs. I'm sure that'll be the next big thing. I mean, people are pirating ebooks, people are pirating everything. So when you get to 3D printing, I think pirating designs is, is the next logical step, right? You know, well, I look at it. Yeah, look, go ahead. Look at it this way. If you've got like a fancy furniture maker or designer, I, I can't think of any names right now. Let's say Ethan Allen because I don't know the difference between that and a hole in the ground. But let's say Ethan Allen has some coffee table that everybody is just dying to get. And to get that design, you go to their quote-unquote site in this weird future and you download the design for this, for, this, uh, for this coffee table. I mean, it's not long before Ikea-like people or somebody down the line, you know, the Walmart of the future has equivalents to that piece of furniture without it being so expensive. And in other words, they're knockoffs. They're not exactly the same. They're a little bit the same. To me, it seems like the only difference between, I mean, there's a lot of other complications here, but the, the big difference between now and then, all things being equal, is that it's still this issue of you can go buy this really expensive Gucci bag or I can go down to Tijuana and get a really, you know, crummy knockoff for way less money and it still functions as a bag. I think that economy still exists it just exists in design form, assuming that this system works, that we can actually do this at home. It's the designs that get knocked off instead of the actual product. And it, to me, that's the same. It's just handing the baton to a different technology, really. Well, in the Sword and Laser Book Club, we're reading Rule 34 by Charlie Strauss right now. And the premise of the, of the book, it's a novel uh, set in the not-too-distant future. But the premise is that there are unlicensed fabs out there. They, and that's what they call 3D printers. And if you have a licensed fab, then you have to play by the rules and you have to install certain software to make sure you don't download mm -hmm. you know, copyright-protected designs without permission, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, there's a whole big third uh, you know, black market in an unlicensed fabs that can print all kinds of stuff without approval. And that causes issues and 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 a, and a black market in in device repair and people finding the right design so mm -hmm. there's a definitely a secondary market that can grow up around this thing in all kinds of ways by the way people in the chat room pointing out maybe we can print burgers since we're able to yeah. grow beef in a petri Which, dish so you know i'm vegan and that still sounds that might, like something yeah. i would i wouldn't eat but a monkey stick in the chat has a good point that replicators worked in the federation of star trek because they didn't need currency and ideas were just shared 
it's funny, you know, in thinking about, th you know, that sort of a utopia really makes sense. I mean, I was just thinking about it right now as we're, as we're saying, think about all the security protections we put into currency, into dollars, and think about as 3D printers get more sophisticated. I'm sure, you know, that that will be a new uh, means of uh It's already with, we just with printing yeah. on paper. Yeah. Counter yeah. Counterfeiting measures have gotten uh, much more complex. That's a good point. Well, and also not everyone's going to be able to fit these giant printers in their home. Like I have a, a small apartment. You know, well, it's not super small, but it's 700 square foot feet. And I couldn't fit a huge printer that could print on a couch or a table in here. I'd only need it once or twice. Maybe anyway. Not even a sectional? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of sections, you know, 15 so, or well, six. <laughs> there would have to that, be some that, kind of – like on Star Trek, yeah, you know, yeah. there was – everybody had a replicator in their home. But there was also those places they could go to to print bigger things and go gift shopping for friends or whatever. And they would there would also almost need to be some kind of communal printer where you go in and you somehow pay or however it works that has all the materials you need. Or maybe you have to provide the recycled materials and have it printed out. I mean, it's feasible to have a small one, but not something that large. You know, I was talking about this on a spreecast the other day. We were talking about – we did a uh, spreecast about the return of vinyl records. And we were talking about how vinyl used to be bootlegged. You would find rogue record plant manufacturers yeah. that would create a new stamp and just use their record pressing plant to make – bootlegs. That's and it wasn't that. You just needed one copy of the record yeah. to be able to make it work. So, I mean, pre-digital, people were doing it in a physical way. I think for in terms of counterfeiting, this is going to open a huge, huge uh, set of possibilities for counterfeiters to make boot bootleg goods. Yeah, if you, th you think the battles over copyrighted music yeah. and television shows are nasty, wait until 3D printing catches on. And it's not going to be that long. No, I think within 10 years. The, the MakerBot replicator, which is about this big and can print up items that, you know, size of a couple fists is available right now for around $2,000. Uh, in right. five, five years, it's going to be able to do bigger items for cheaper. And you can use it to make another replicator. That's right. That's why it's called the replicator. Yes. Because it can print itself out. <laughs> exactly. And then we're doomed. I, I, and I, hate, I hate to keep taking it, dragging it, kicking and screaming back to Minecraft, but it's on my mind. <laughs> this, idea that, this idea that you could in your home. So you, you know what? Nicole, you make a great point. It's like I can't have a giant couch printer in my house. It just doesn't function that way. But I think we start to see things become very modular. Mm. I think we start to see a couch become, oh, that's my video, Tony's showing, a couch that becomes sectional in the sense that, you know, the, the world of Minecraft is made up of, of these cubes, perfect cubes, and everything is sort of, you know, legoed on top of each other. And many things are sort of created from these cubes. And, and it, it, in, in a way, you're kind of creating dot matrix objects out of these cubes. I don't see any reason why we couldn't get used to couches having that kind of modular quality. So you're, you're, you're really just having this thing crap out perfect, you know, squares or flat planks or something that are reasonably sized and then you assemble them. And so there's some assembly required. People still have to sort of put a little bit of sweat equity into things that they build at home. But I feel like, like that's Legos. a place, I think that's a place we might be, you know, happily taken, especially if it just means, you know, all we're giving up is a kind of aesthetic for a different kind of aesthetic. And we're okay with that, that, you know, sort of new look and I think once we as a society get used to those sorts of things, that makes this tech more and more probable as, a, you know, a practical device or appliance in the home and, and for smaller apartments or smaller living spaces, which we'll probably have a lot more of in the future anyway. So, so yeah, I think there's ways to do this. But you're right. You're right. It'd be great to go to the mall and say, I want a boat and have this thing just <laughs> poop a boat out and take the boat, you know? I just, now that awesome. you're talking about it this way, not the pooping a boat part, but the part before, um, <laughs> it, it makes, it's going to be a class, a symbol of class, that you have an yeah. Ikea couch instead of a modular printed out couch. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, Don't ooh. you think the modular would become the Ikea, though, of the future? Exactly. Well, that's what I'm saying, is that the <laughs> oh, modular <I> <laughs> becomes Ikea, and then if you actually have a solid item... Like like the one we buy now at IKEA. But, oh, spent a lot of money on your futon. And, uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't print that one out, did you? Bought it whole. Wow, Mister yeah. Bags. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty good. All right, folks. Thank you, I, John. Great prediction. Got us a great conversation going. Uh, thanks for sending it to us. Uh, you can uh, anybody can send us their predictions. Email them forecastpodcast at gmail dot com or post them up on our blog forecastpodcast dot com. We're gonna get into Glenn and Nicole's predictions in a second. Uh, but I want to thank our sponsor, Netflix, streaming thousands of TV episodes and movies straight to your home. They just launched Lilyhammer, their first original program. Not made, This one isn't made by Netflix. They have a few that they've commissioned directly. This one was made by uh, Norwegian uh, television network NHK1, but it was done in conjunction with Netflix. Netflix funded it, and it's getting its U.S. premiere on Netflix. You can watch it today, Lilyhammer, 
all eight episodes of season one available on netflix.com streaming and you can try out netflix for free watch all eight episodes for free netflix.com slash twit starting today be sure to use that url when you sign up for the free trial or if you're already a netflix subscriber go and uh, tell your friends they can watch it for free netflix.com slash twit we thank them for their support of forecast all right nicole we're going to start with you uh your predictions of the future what do you got okay my prediction it's it's kind of a, a simple one but i predict that the government is going to start requiring email addresses the same way they require like, physical addresses uh I, you know i'm actually i'm very surprised that this hasn't already been implemented in some ways even as just an optional thing i move around a lot so i have to fill out a lot of forms whenever i get a new driver's license or a a license plate and, you know, your tax forms. And I never, there are very few places where you actually have to fill out uh, an email address. And I just, I, I see that coming, especially when the older generations start, I guess, dying off and the newer generation who uses computers and emails almost on a, a very regular hourly basis. So that's interesting. I think the reason that we haven't seen that happen, and it's a good question as to why they haven't, I, mean, I guess requirement is, is, a, is a loaded gun. It's a loaded word. Um, you know, when, it, when a government starts requiring you to do something, we're, we're all used to being required to having a physical address, but we're not, you know, the, the email idea sounds so oppressive to me for some reason. I think that's probably part of it. But also, a physical address is a physical address. It is a place they can count on. And even if you move, that address is still there so they can at least follow up and see that you've moved and you just haven't reported in yet. But that, that place existed. It was a thing. Um, with email, it's a lot more more you know it's a lot more difficult it's a lot more virtual it's a lot more sort of ethereal and it can change willy-nilly and they would have to probably start you know settling on some some standards that made it so you had to adhere to certain maybe even unthought of standards of email uh, ownership that would really you know quite literally tie it to you that you couldn't get rid of you couldn't just say well today i'm gonna i'm using yahoo forget gmail i'm done with gmail those kinds of things um do you feel like that's maybe what's what's held it back or or Nicole, what do you think? What do you think is holding them back? As, as surprised as you are that they haven't done this, what do you what do you think? Maybe some of the reasons are that they haven't. Well, I think that a big part of it is there are still people out there who don't even use the use computers and don't have email. Uh, you know, like grandparents, even some people's parents uh, don't really get on the computer that often. And uh, I mean, I don't think it at this point. I'm not surprised it's not required. I'm just surprised that it's really not. It doesn't exist in as many places that are, as I was expect it to be. Like, I mean, the IRS is a really big one. You, when you get, you know, an email or a letter from the IRS, you know, I got back from a, a vacation over or the holidays and I got a letter from the IRS. It ended up being something that was they made a mistake or it was actually from my previous address. I used to live in Utah. They made a mistake with my taxes and I had this like money they were expecting me to pay and I had like two weeks to get it to them because I got the letter late and I'm like oh, you know if I had gotten an email about this I could have got take care of it right away especially if I'd actually had to pay the money then I would have done it as soon as I got the email but you don't get that you know you have to wait for a letter to get in the mail to be forwarded from your old address and uh, it just it would just be nice to be an option at this point I think eventually you know after it being an option for so long eventually it would be required but, you know, like you said, I think there should be they, they would probably have some kind of standards, like maybe specific domains that you have to have an email address with or at least one of your email addresses with. Because I think that at least all of us here probably have several email addresses that, you know, we can be accessed through. Yeah. I, I, Glenn, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, or? I think it's I've seen it as an optional thing with some government forms. But what I'm wondering is and it just because I haven't maybe heard somebody use this excuse lately, does email get lost anymore? That used to be a great excuse for many years. Oh, my spam. It's in my yeah, spam filter. Yeah, spam yeah no, I still hear that. One. Yeah. I get spam filter occasionally, but, you know, I'm on my secure email address, my locked down. I don't subscribe to mailing lists with, with this email address. Like, that's easy enough. I get maybe one spam message a month. It's easy mm -hmm. enough to go in there. You can still use the that. excuse. No one would. Oh, know. You can use, exactly. That's what's great about it. <laughs> or the other one that I like. Did you ever do this with Outlook of changing your computer's date and going back and sending it from the date so it looked like you'd sent it months ago? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah even though it would also spoof there. the email. Address. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. There used to be a lot of good tricks for that. But well, I think and you guys are you guys are laying out the tricks. Then I mean, Glenn, you're describing yeah. reasons why this would probably not work <laughs> as a requirement. But um, Gmail, though, I think in particular. And this is one thing that really impressed me within the last year or so. Gmail all of a sudden got ultra secure. 
in terms of adding in different security features, account alerts, almost so much so that it made it a little annoying as a user mm -hmm. how many secure protocols they put into that. But I think that when you have the Hotmails, AOLs, and Yahoos of the world not following suit to that extent, I think it, make, it makes it really hard to implement it in a way that's considered government official secure enough. Well, yeah, I, I had a couple reactions. One, the U.S. Post Office floated a proposal to give everyone in the United States an email address. Uh, that that went along with their physical address and it was killed for many, many different reasons. One of the reasons is because we're the United States of America. We hate the social security number already. The idea of the government making you have anything is always resisted. Uh, and, and the government has even proposed a, a, a virtual ID system because it's necessary. I mean, everybody wants it, right? We have Because we have multiple email addresses. It would be great if we had one identification system that we could use at all sites. We don't have to remember the one very long and secure password, et cetera, et cetera. But the government getting involved got everybody's back raised up. We don't, want, we don't want a government ID system. They shouldn't be involved. And even that proposal was a proposal of setting standards that independent companies would have to step in and provide the service for. So there's such resistance to the government assigning us anything. Because honestly, I mean, easy enough, if you wanted a, an ID system, which is essentially what you're describing with an email address, they could just take the social security system and say, that number at us.gov, boom, there's your ID. But because because yeah. everybody's so like, oh, but I shouldn't have to give my social security number out to anyone, you know, at, at any time. Then ha haven't they done some weird uh, sort of half measures with I seem to recall like maybe it was paying a parking ticket or some IRS thing or some California state tax thing where your password like you can log into a page, but your password is it like verifies your driver's license number, gets your social security number or something hmm. like that. I've, I've seen that yeah. in some sort of government correspondence. It could like, be, but the, so you, that you, that's actually a real, yeah. that's a great direction to take this. The idea that the, here's how the government does it, all right? This yeah. is how they pull it off. They start to make, and they kind of do this with some stuff now. Like I can mail in to get my, new, my renewed driver's license. I, don't, I no longer have to go in as long as I do it in the right dates to the actual DMV and go through the rigmarole and retest and all that. I can do this more convenient way. What they need to do is the things that we're already have, we've already accepted as both local and national law based uh, requirements of us to do. We should, they should start making those more and more convenient. But by doing so, we give up a little something, and that is maybe our social security number is converted to some sort of ID, or you know that becomes our at you know america.gov <laughs> yeah. uh, email address or whatever so that so that we are actually recognizing and it's going to be a slow haul for them because not everyone's going to jump on this and there are people hiding their bunkers with their guns and never come out but but a lot of us would go oh yeah i don't i can save all this time on my taxes by doing what now you bet i'll give you a i'll have an id i don't care i mean that that's how they do it is they start giving us incentives to make other stuff less of a hassle and, and people would probably buy in. I would probably buy in if, if that was the case. I think it's a, an interesting idea. I mean, remember, though, remember, what was it? The Pentium 2 was originally supposed to have some locked-in secure uh, ID yeah. feature in the microprocessor that would identify you online. And they yep, tried that yep. with MAC address. It seems like every time they try and do that, one, people show them how easy it is to work around it. Right. And spoof or change something. I think that might be the only thing getting in the way is until we get, you know, thumbprint access or, or retinal scan access to the Internet. But then I'll gouge out yeah, your exactly. eyes and cut or off I'll, your thumb. I'll use my 3D printer to make a replica of your <laughs> eyeball. Yeah, exactly. I'll print out your eyeball. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then you'll be sorry. Yeah, the, uh, H in the chat room says, I want Ace Detect to have one super authentic ID. It will be that much easier to hack and take over. And he brings up a really good point, which is you have a single point of failure if you mm -hmm. have a single ID. The, the response to that is if you only if you have a single ID, it's much easier to make it very secure. The problem that we have now with multiple <laughs> logins and multiple IDs is be, we need to make them easy because we have so many of them. If we only had one, you could use a you could use dual factor authentication with a very strong encrypted password, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you, know, you know, use the all of the, the firepower we've developed for security on that one ID uh, and and. And that would be easy. But but H isn't wrong. It, if the target's valuable enough and you could and you could hack it, you've you've hacked everything. That's true. I you know what you it's so funny because you can say on the one hand, look at what look at this amazing tech that that we the people have have created. You know, we the people and peoples from all over the world have figured out ways to innovate in uh, security. We've innovated in all sorts of technologies that allow for really incredible stuff. The many 
people say, well, all we're saying is take that awesome, cool thing and just let the government use it for this. I mean, even starting the sentence makes yeah. people's butter curl a little bit, right? I mean, that's not even a phrase and they're doing it. Curd. So I like think that, your butter, I don't know. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like all you do, all you have to do is suggest it. And even I get a little prickly about it. It's like, oh yeah, but. But then again, we don't really have a private sector way of everybody going, yep, ID me, put a chip in the back of my neck. Because even if you start talking that way, we don't really trust Microsoft to do that or Apple to do we that. We only or, trust it for our pets. You know, right. the, the other reason it could happen, though, the other thing happening in parallel to this is there's been talk in recent years more and more about um, doing uh, electronic, uh, you know, making electronic medical records and mm -hmm. using that as a means to cut down on health care costs. And so it seems like there are so many incentives towards doing it, but then there's so many privacy concerns towards doing it. I mean, of having a government-secured way to identify yourself electronically, which yeah. is really what it comes down to. But, I think. And I think an electronic ID would still be more secure than the current system we have of IDing yourself. <laughs> Getting back to you, Nicole, which is this horrible way of like having an address and a piece of plastic that can be easily replicated. I mean, people's IDs get stolen all the time. So, Way up north saying in Norway... There's a centralized website. We securely log in. Using your social security number. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, but it's, those it, Norwegians, man. I, I think we'll they, see they make great TV. I think we'll see a good, <laughs> uh, well, I think we'll see a forward thinking smaller country do it first and perfect it. And then the U.S. will adopt it. And whatever right. administration does, it will be like accused of, of acting like a, a European social state or whatever. Right, they, right, be, right. You know, they, they want to take the cues from Norway, you know. Mm. What, what do you think, Nicole? Are you still you still wanting the the government issued an email address? Well, no. See, I think it's there's just interesting to kind of look back and see how the, the conversation progressed because I, my original uh, idea or my prediction was just not that we had to be issued something completely different than what we already have, but just to actually have be you know forced to provide something as a means of contact from from your own so. private store. It could be a Gmail address, could be a Yahoo. You just have you yeah. have, you just have to have one, is what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that that was like the basic premise of what I was thinking about. But then it's you know, but then it probably would get construed as different ways, or maybe the government we would try to say, oh, well, we have this in place. Now that we have everybody's email address, let's make them, let's force them to do other ones. So I could, it could go, it could go that way. Yeah, I think, I think if they did it today, there would still be resistance because there's enough people who either don't have the internet or don't understand the internet that they would resist a requirement. But give it 10 years, maybe not even that long, and so many people will have email addresses that will be considered sort of obvious to say, well, of course I need to have an email address. How, how can you exist in society without an email address? Um, because, and somebody brought this up early in the conversation when we were still talking about your prediction and hadn't strayed off into, into our uh, terrible conspiracy land. Argument. Uh, you know, <laughs> that requirement is actually better for homeless people because homeless mm -hmm. people have access to computers through libraries and through outreach organizations and can have an email address where they don't have a stable mm -hmm. physical address. Is, that's kind of a sad commentary on our society. Like, homeless people have email addresses. We can't figure out their housing. Yeah. But we can give them access to the internet. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least, you, you know. Those were our priorities. Hey, it's an improvement. <laughs> Don't look a gift email in their mouth. <laughs> that's the old phrase. That's old saying. <laughs> from never. All right, Glenn, uh, let's move over to you. Your prediction. Okay, you I came up with there? some kind of silly ones in the next 10 years. I'll just spat out the silly ones before getting the serious one. But uh, next 10 years, I think we're going to see a rise of uh, people uh, raising hipster babies with British accents to sound more sophisticated. <laughs> That's you know? my baby. Uh, people will uh, start going to rehab to get insurance to pay for their vacation. They won't really have a drug problem. They'll just want to go to Passages Malibu for 15 days, you know. Wow. Uh, assisted, li assisted living communities for the lazy. <laughs> just the idea that retirement seems really nice. How can I get in on this while I'm still young enough to really enjoy it? But uh, the one that, you know, I was thinking about today, I was thinking about, uh, you know, with Newt Gingrich and all the talk of moon colonies on Mars. Mm. I was thinking... Why would that, you put a moon colony well, on Mars? What we... Or not Mars, on the moon... Pardon me. Yeah, yeah moon, moon colonies, colonies moon and, and going to Mars. Um, <laughs> what I was thinking about was no one's talked about in a while with stem cells and whatnot that's been going on. No one has talked about cloning. We haven't uh -huh. heard about cloning lately. All right. And maybe it's just a little of, you know, my love of, like, boys from Brazil and things of that nature. I think in the next 10 years, next 10 to 20 years, we're seeing enough high-profile people dying, like, you know, Steve Jobs of, of the world and whatnot, or, you know, even in their country, uh, like, you know, the North Korean situation. Uh, we're going to see— the dear leader. Yes. Yeah. We're going to see enough high-profile people dying that somebody is going to try— and circumvent the supposed ban, which was weird. We're going to have a ban on human cloning. I think somebody's going to do it. 
I think somebody, you know, if they haven't already, it could have happened. We just don't know anything about it. But I think there's going to be a high profile case coming to light of someone being cloned. And not from so, the Raelians. No. Right. No. Okay. So more more than just like because because now there's a lot of talk and, and, and there's some proof or some supporting evidence that some leaders uh, and some tyrants have done this. We're not talking about just getting a body double. Hey, that dude looks like me. Pull him out yeah. of the crowd and let's go. Um, like we, you know, we saw some of that in the Hussein regime, especially when he would go out in public appearances and stuff. And we all remember the film Dave. Yes. I mean, come on. Dave, Dave, Dave is was a great, a great film. example. Uh, but yours, it is actually. But you're saying, oh, you may want to see Dave now. Um, you're saying that, like, literally cloning somebody from from either, you know, early stage embryonic, you know, something, all the way to, hey, we got a chamber, put dude A in there, and dude B will pop out, and he'll look just like dude A. I guarantee you someone, you know, and maybe it's too soon to talk about this, but, you know, I would say someone in the Steve Jobs family thought, hey, let's save a little DNA. You never know. But now, mm -hmm. are you saying you're not going so far again, so we don't go down the rabbit hole uh, too too quickly. You're not saying that you're transferring consciousness or anything. No, not transferring okay. consciousness. They're, but they're going to say so that brings up the whole nature nurture. Hey, we've we've got some hairs. Let's uh, you know if you put clone in a dish. Steve Jobs, but he doesn't grow up adopted and mountain, well, it'll you know. be like the boys from Brazil. They'll make a which if you haven't seen that movie, shame on you. Uh, where they essentially made like what was it like fifty little Hitlers. Right. And, uh, you know, just raised them up, figuring one of them's got to turn out to be like uh, the Fuhrer. You know, it's, it's bound to happen. But, but when he's young and adorable, oh, hey, it's a little Hitler. Yeah. You know? uh, but I think. Always I, love a baby Hitler. Yes. I, I think <laughs> it could happen. I think it could totally happen that somebody will get this idea, especially. And I think the stem cell stuff, that's great. I think in terms of curing disease, there's a lot of great stuff we can do with stem cells. Um, so much so apparently that now we have to have, you know, bans on any, you know, stem cells entering food products, which is kind of weird. But I think that uh, with cloning, I think I think it's going to come back around to that. By the way, Fifty Little Hitlers is my Ray Conniff Singer's cover band. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Baby but, Hitler was my wrestling name. But I do want to say one last thing uh, about that. Or right, before we throw it to uh, or, uh, to Nicole, because I want to hear what she has to say. But the idea is, I can't square this, Glenn. This idea that you okay, let's say it's an embryonic stem cell research project gone successful, and we're able to clone each other. We make a clone of. I don't know. I'm trying to think of it. One of you know the Kim Jong Il's son, uh, the Un dude. Kim Jong Un. Let's yeah, we got him now. We got a baby version of him. So let's say they have the wherewithal to raise him just enough to be, you know, the the same leader that he that the real one is. But the real one is still aging. He's still gonna mm -hmm. die. So and it's gonna take what another. I don't know how old that dude is. What is he? Thirty something. Yeah. It's going to take, you know, 30-something years to even get to that point. By then, he's, you know, 60-something years. Like, I don't understand where you do the crossover. Like, where's the, <laughs> where's the smoke and mirrors where we're suddenly just one day it was him on the microphone, the next day it's the other guy, and we were none the wiser? You know, I, I don't know, but I think that the, the, if they plan ahead, let me, let me put it this way. In 30 years, Apple shareholders might be wishing that they had this foresight. Didn't they already try this with Dick Clark? <laughs> <laughs> They're trying it now, Tom. Yeah. Don't try it. It's happening now. Yeah. So, Nicole, what's your position on human cloning? Uh, well, just to kind of... <laughs> and did you mirror. think you would ever be asked that? I did not think I'd ever be asked that. But just to kind of mirror what Scott was saying, you know, actually my question was going to be, well, why would they do this to begin with? And it seems like only in a place like North Korea would mm -hmm. they clone, you know, Kim Jong-un and then have him, you know, be raised basically the same way that Kim Jong-un was raised to be a leader, you know, to be a leader of a horrible country like North Korea. And then the people would automatically follow him just because they're brainwashed and that's what they do. So that really only seems like the uh, logical way of actually like having a world or not world leader, but, you know, a, a country leader to actually have their own clone take over their, their position. And other circumstances i don't understand why it would be uh motivating to clone someone unless it's just nostalgic or i i don't understand what the purpose would be if, like you could, if you could if you could do yeah and if you could duplicate them right now that's something different it's like yeah. oh grandma's dying what do we do make another grandma and she's oh, the grandma same age. The fridge. Yeah. right make a new grandma she's the same age she's still sweet she makes your cookies she's the same grandma you always knew otherwise you got to raise grandma nobody wants to raise grandma you so 
<laughs> well, I think in some cases there could be applications of people that want to do it as a means of reproduction. Maybe if they're a single person and they're looking for, you know, the best way to, to, to go about it in some weird science fiction, future uh, forward thinking way. I think that it could exist in that form. But no, I think that it's not perfect. I'm not saying it's going to work out. And we're probably going to find that, you know, clones, when they fully mature into being like, you know, uh, brain eating zombie people. I mean, we could find out or, you know, all clones are evil. I mean, if sci-fi has taught us anything, it's that these experiments right. never Don't turn out. Science. Never turn well, someone out well. In the, someone in the, I'm sorry, I didn't mean yeah, to interrupt you. <laughs> I was just reading the chat and someone was like, organ har harvest. And that reminded me of that movie, The Island. It, yeah, oh, right. That, I mean, that actually makes perfect sense. It, it's, you know, I think even in the movie, it was completely illegal for them to be doing that because they didn't think that the... Um, and totally spoiler if you guys haven't seen, haven't seen the movie, which, that, but if, yeah. if people have uh, have consciousness, which they didn't think that they would, so I guess that makes sense. You know, for people like Steve Jobs, if they had done something like that, then maybe <laughs> they would have been able to do something. Who knows? You know, for anyone that's dying with, if they have a clone out there somewhere, they can just replace their dying body part, assuming it wasn't uh, something that was going to be with them regardless. And that's how mm -hmm. it'll get legalized, is because with stem cells, right. and we've used that, and I believe in that argument with stem cells. Let me just goes one hundred percent when people say. Say, you know, look at uh, Christopher Reeve, look at Michael J. Fox, look at those uh, situations. Stem cells would be very helpful in trying to treat those, those instances. But I could see people making the same argument that, hey, if we have cloning and you can have a backup you, much like in The Island, which I actually thought was was a better film than most people made it out to be. Better than Transformers. I loved it. Yeah, I, I, loved I it. really enjoyed it, actually. But I'm, that, not gonna lie. I'm not going to mess around. I thought The Island was a freaking awesome I movie. Kinda, I kind of liked it. it. Nicole, did you like it? I did like it. And I think we're 100% yeah, agree. Why, why did but... everybody just crap all over that film? I'm sorry, what were you nobody, saying? Because nobody likes Michael. Because I had Ewan McGregor in it. That's oh, well, there you go. <laughs> but oh. I did like the story. I thought it was a very interesting story. I, I watched it a few times, actually. But I think that's an argument that could be made about, you know, clone yourself, have some backup organs. You know, but then it, a bit much like in the movie, it'll become the status symbol of the, of the super rich. Well, it's possible you know? to clone the organ without cloning the entire person. Yeah. That, that takes a lot of the... And then we're yeah. just in a weird Moral multiplicity situation. Out of it, yeah. Yeah, for the, for, the, for the leader to go on thing, I've been thinking about this more. And I've been playing a lot of Minecraft. Just kidding, it's got nothing to do with Minecraft. Um, <laughs> Man, Minecraft you, people are worse than, <laughs> than fans of The Wire. And as a fan know, of The Wire, I think I'm pretty bad in bringing it back to The Wire. But Scott, right. with Minecraft, sir, you've taken it to a new it's level. It's crazy. That game is crazy. And I can't believe it took me so long to play it. But anyway, my, my, um, what I was going to say is like you, you, could, you could spin it. Because you made me think of this... Um, Nicole, when you when you mentioned that that in North Korea you've got a lot of sort of brainwashed people who are ready to take whatever you feed them, and the idea that that you could say, you know, people look look we have the miniature great leader and we've done it because we have the technology and the West didn't and we're amazing and they're not and we have done the incredible thing with his leadership and our technology we have created a clone of the great leader and he will take over in whatever many years. People would eat that stuff up. They would freaking love it. So you Literally. kind of in that one comment solved my issue with it, which is you know, in, in, in a scenario where you're trying to replace a dictator, it's the perfect look how awesome we are PR move to, to clone the leader and have it have to be raised and chronicle that and film it, have weird singing behind it all the time and those weird videos they do. That stuff's perfect. It's made for North Korea. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like that. that's where we're coalescing around is the idea that this will be good for cults whether they are <laughs> whether they are the cult of the people's democratic republic of north korea or uh, of korea or or some kind of you know out in the hills cult but but those are the only people who will that this will make sense for you know what it's kind of like i just had to look it up to remember the movie little buddha Oh, Remember yeah. that idea of, yeah, of, of yeah. the Buddhist teacher that was reincarnated yeah. and they tried to find the little boy? Right. I mean, I'm not I look Instead I like Instead of Buddhism, having to search all yeah, over for the little boy, just you just him. Yeah, you just You're gonna have to grow a lot of them in a lot of different situations to try to get the That's same. what they did in Boys from Brazil. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And that that young actor in that let me just take a second while we're talking about the island of Minecraft. Boys from Brazil, the kid that played little Hitler, so talented because he played a couple different little Hitlers in like different countries with different accents and whatnot. It's a very good movie. Steve Gutenberg's in it. Really, you have to see this film. Oh, well, then I'm in if Steve Young Gutenberg. Steve Gutenberg. Right. Okay. And not the oh, home theater like... reviewer. <laughs> yeah. Are you talking pre-Cocoon Steve Gutenberg? Oh, yeah. This was like one of his first roles. He's not the star. Who was the star of it? I want to say it was uh, Laurence Olivier played the Nazi oh. hunter who uncovers okay. the whole conspiracy. Wow. wow. Yeah, it's a, it's right. a very good movie. I'm in. All right. I think we've solved cloning. Yes. <laughs> you had me when you told me that one of the men and the baby was in it, and I'm, I'm all in when I hear that. <laughs>
<laughs> Shall we move to four questions then, Scott Johnson? I think we should. Four questions is where we ask our guests four questions rapid fire style. They are not allowed to think too hard about these questions, Tom. They must answer from the gut. I'm going to start by asking my questions of Glenn. Glenn, are you sitting comfortably? Uh, yes. As comfortable as those electrified chairs in the Twit <laughs> studios are. Here we go. What is the next current medium? What? Oh, sorry. What is the next current medium to hi to high what to high profile? Oh, okay, I got it. Sorry, you wrote it. What? I wrote it. I did. I, like eight o'clock this morning. All right, here we go. <laughs> what is the next current to medium or high profile MMO to shut its servers down? Who's next? Who goes down next? You know, I th I think Warcraft's going to have to do something new and bold, and I think they they might shut down the current game to replace it with the new one. Mm, wow, that Titan. is bold. That, that's yeah. very bold. I think you're smoking crack, but I like your ideas. All right, next I like up. your crack. Which uh, <laughs> no, I, we take that. Uh, back. <laughs> the correct answer should be Ultima Online, but that's going to go on forever. All right, oh, the way Ultima fictional... Online still uh, still up. Oh yeah, that game's still <laughs> going. It's crazy. Uh, which fictional sheriff slash marshal would you want in charge of law enforcement when life is one big space western? Raylan Givens, Rooster Cogburn, or Payton from Silverado, and why? Oh man, like wait, like I get have to choose between the fictional sheriffs. Yeah, or you if you have another fictional sheriff, we'll allow that. I was gonna say Boss Hog because I think that would just be interesting. <laughs> is he a sheriff? Though? Was he the sheriff? He was. He was no, just the mayor. He would just like pull the strings. Who did uh, uh, Suzanne Summers play on? A, She's the sheriff. Oh there? my gosh! That'll, that'll be that'll be a fun comedy. <laughs> it would be terrible. Yeah. I forgot that existed. Thanks yeah. for reminding me. No problem. Um, he was no, the commissioner yeah. of Hazard County, oh, yeah. according like, to Wikipedia. Tom's quick with the fact checking. Yeah. There. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? I'm going to take. I'm going to allow it. We're going to take Boss Hog. Okay. Just because I don't know why. All right. Next question. If we can finally get to a very. I'm sorry. If we can finally get to the very very bottom of the ocean, what do you expect we'll find there? The abyss. <laughs> and the Haven't aliens you ever in the seen abyss. The movie, I just the watched abyss. it two weeks ago again. Which You'll is, find a, a breathing, functioning Ed Harris. Is that what you're telling me? The Abyss is a great movie when you think about it, but when you watch it, you remember this is like three and a half hours long and very slow in parts. But I think I think that exists. Those uh, those uh, what were they? Uh, UTIs? No. Yeah. No, they weren't. They're, not UTI. urinary tract infections. No, but something <laughs> like that. They were. Uh, they were abyss tract infections. But they had a, a, an abbreviation like No, I can't remember. I yeah. don't remember. It was you, like UTI. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Tom, you're killing me. All right, last question. What modern day cereal should we be mixing marshmallows with to make squares out of next? Uh, Booberry. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. Sold. Uh, we do this, just for the record, we do this with uh, coarse rice krispies. That's a standard. But we also do cocoa pebbles around here and mm -hmm. fruity pebbles. And it is a sugar bomb. Like, you just, I don't, don't, it's really good, but I don't recommend it. I mean, it's enough sugar to put a kid into orbit. So watch out for that. What about something like a little more adult with like Crispix or something like that? I like think brand for buds or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There yeah. you go. You get some, your fiber and some sugar at the C same time. Cinnamon Toast Crunch. <laughs> oh, oh that'd man. Be good. Yeah. <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> All right. That's my four questions. Way to go. You passed. Tom, over to you. All right, I, my, I, I'm worried my questions are going to bore you now, Nicole. Uh, I'm after, scared, actually. I've seen yeah. this, and I, I, I have the questions you guys ask people. I don't even know what you're talking about. All right, just, just, just answer the first thing that comes to your mind. Don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, question number one, what food that we regularly eat now will seem incredibly revolting to people a thousand years from now? Kind of mm, like when you go to another mushrooms. country. Mushrooms. Mushrooms, because they grow it in poo. Well, not always. No, th th those are the I drug like kinds. Don't get me wrong. I just think that, you know, I mean, I, a thousand years from now, right? I like dung mushrooms. Yeah. The, <laughs> wait, aren't those the magic ones? Isn't that how they grow those specifically? <laughs> yeah, those are the ones that are hallucinogenic in nature. Yeah, aren't they? Nice to know where Nicole's uh, thinking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I, can see, I can see them saying like, hey, it's a fungus. Who would eat that? Yeah. It's a good answer. Uh, question number two. Will Earth always have humans living on it? And, if, and, if, and, and why? You mean like we won't be living on it and they'll be gone forever? Yeah. Will Earth, will the planet Earth always have humans living on it? And could mean that we die out or it could mean that we just move. Uh, yeah, I think, I think we'll, they'll always have humans living on it. All right. I think we'll find ways. Why, how, how do we survive? We just, because we're creative? 
Uh, well, you know, wars and famine and diseases and zombie apocalypses. If people survive those things. Yeah. So it's, you know, it, and then you just regrow the population. Yeah. If Kirkman has taught us anything, it's that we will survive. <laughs> Uh, question number three. What kind of foods will we first eat from other planets? Oh. Uh, like leafy greens. <laughs> will they be something we grew there or just like, hey, oh, it's planet yeah. of the leafy greens. Check it out. Salad planet. <laughs> awesome. No, I think that we'll find some kind of planet that, sus that sustain that has, you know, plants and water and like flowing streams and stuff. And then we'll just try the plants. <laughs> yeah, it seems safe, right? Before you, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, they'll do some tests on them and stuff to make sure they're good and right. then make solids. <laughs> what if those plants are like talking and sentient and they walk in and go, "Hello, <laughs> I am the giant plant of ah," and you just are, you're eating live living. Oh uh, man, yeah. <laughs> vegans are gonna have. You, what are you gonna do? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm more worried that the plants are gonna have some weird parasite. The plants are gonna be the parasite that takes mm -hmm. it over. So everyone's gonna go, "Ooh, space plants," and then you eat the that's space salad, invasion then of the body become, snatchers. You can become the salad. Yes. Or wasn't it like there was a movie where like wasn't it the, the plants were ex exuding some kind of chemical as recent uh, with Mark Wahlberg or something where the plants were making the a happening themselves? right yeah the happening yeah yeah horribly Sorry. edited that that could have been a good movie but they they Just make Zoe Deschanel and Mark Wahlberg after every line. <laughs> Just, I mean, what are you doing? <laughs> Cut to the next line. What's wrong with you people? They had to fill up some space. Yeah, I guess they needed, they needed to meet their hour and a half quota. Yeah. yeah. Uh, finally, question number four. Will we colonize space or the ocean floor first? Uh, definitely space. Yeah. It's just oh. fancier. Yeah, I agree. Because um, what was it? What was, I don't even remember the, uh, the name of the TV show about living in the ocean. Oh, uh, with the, the dolphins and the kid in it. Um, Space Quest or Sequest. 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 Yeah. Sequest yeah. DSV. How many Sequests have there been versus how many space shows? It's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for Sequest SVU. That was going to be the big, <laughs> awesome spinoff. Sequest Special Victim. You know, though, we do have a hotel on the yeah, ocean floor that already. looks awesome. Yeah. Like, I would be terrified to stay there because if anything I learned from Jaws 3 <laughs> is true, it's that things go wrong, pipes break. Yeah. You know, sharks will eat you. And the UTI. Not even, <laughs> yeah, the UTI. Yeah. You know, I looked it up. It was NTIs. NTI. Non-terrestrial intelligence. Ah, okay. So I was close. Very nice. Very good. Okay. So, but space. I kind of agree with you. It's just, <laughs> it's space. What are you going to do? It's space. <laughs> well, that's it. That, those are your four questions. Thank you, Nicole. Yay. Was it as bad as you feared? <laughs> no, it wasn't. Okay, I, I appreciate the food ones. Even though I, my, my answers were kind of lame. No, they weren't. Oh. I think mushrooms is perfectly reasonable. I, I was I wasn't sure how I would answer that question until you said mushrooms. I'm like, well, yeah, that's we should all we should Tigers already be future. grossed out by mushrooms. We should all be disgusted by them. Mushrooms when I put a big, are delicious. They are delicious. And I love them, dude. I love mushrooms. Big old shiitake on the grill. Mm. But they're kind. If you think about it, they're just fungus. They're freaking fungus. I think the the Franken foods, the uh, the way that we treat and process a lot of meats. I think that is going to freak people out in a hundred years. Yeah, I, I have. You know, you That's might be true. right. Not meat eating. And I say this as a vegan. Now. I mean, not just the concept of meat eating, but the way that we treat and produce mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff. I think that grosses uh, people out now. Yeah. So it, they, I think yeah. in a thousand years they're going to be like, "What were they?" You know, we'll find out it creates like some weird disease or something in the future, and be like, "Why were they eating that? It was killing they? them." Yeah. Fungiform, bovine. Whatever. <laughs> All right. Uh, that is it for our show. Thanks, everybody, uh, for joining us. Uh, and uh, thanks to our guest, Glenn Rubenstein. Thank you. Always good to have you on. Let Great folks know back. where uh, they can find what you're Hit up to. Hit me up at uh, Twitter, at Glenn Rubenstein. I'm uh, doing lots of stuff on the Spreecast Network. I'm here Sundays on Twit for Shut Up and Play, the Twit Land Party. And I'll be a guest on Framerate, Valentine's Day, February 14th. Yeah, it's our, it's our date with Ooh. you and Brian. This will be fantastic. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Nicole, so great to meet you. Thank you for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. And let folks know where they can find your work online. Well, I'm, uh, I have a blog, nicolesyblog.com. It's N-I-C-O-L-E-S-Y blog. And I'm at Nicolesy on Twitter. And I also am very active on Google+. Plus, and, and you can find me by either looking for my name, Nicole S. Young, or just by going to nicolesyplus.com. Excellent. Scott Johnson, any, uh, mm. any last words? Well, Tom, I would just have this one. Even though it struck heart or it struck heart in the fear, it struck fear in the heart of many of my followers. Uh, the dust has settled. People can now follow me at a whole new Twitter address. If you already follow me, nothing's changed. Nothing to freak out about. But I am now at Scott Johnson. 
I made the leap. I made the jump. I took some heat for it. Initially, most people said, oh, I wish I had my own name. And those are the people I vote for next, uh, next election. So it's at Scott Johnson. I just want people to be aware of it. Don't be looking at that other one I used to have. It's at Scott Johnson on Twitter. Um, also, just a, a quick note that uh, we are having a wonderful time with the new uh, 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 Old Republic podcast we do on the network. If they want to find out more about that, I recommend they do. Uh, check it out at theinstance.net slash tour if you are at all interested in the new Star Wars The Old Republic MMO. Thanks, everybody, for watching and listening. You can find us on the web at forecastpodcast.com. Leave us your comments there or email them to us, forecastpodcast at gmail.com. We're live on the Twit Network every Monday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Bye. I, however, will never change my Twitter name. Because I want to make you work to find it. Is, yeah, I, you gotta I, work. Even when I include you in tweets, I'm always having to remember. Thank God for the autocomplete. Well, then there's uh, Kuhan. I think it's Kuhan. Uh, started the the most common misspelling of my Twitter name ah. uh, account. And then he replies to people when they at reply that account and say, I think you mean this person. I'm bummed that the guy that has Glenn on Twitter seldom uses it. Oh, really? But he That's follows annoying. like Leo and some Twit people. I'm trying to get him to follow me so I can so, so I can, can like you like, know I'll, get it off of him. Yeah. Like, no, I've got dude. My fro there's the at frog pants and at Scott. The frog pants one is definitely some fan being a wiener and won't give it to me. No. Oh. The guy, yeah, because he the only person he follows is me, <laughs> um, and and he refers to me. Says you're probably looking for Scott Johnson. That's all the posts he has up there. I'm like, just give me the account. And then the other one is uh, is Scott. The same thing with like Glenn. It's this guy's got the account. He has no followers. He's posted two or three times. It's been years between posts. He's doing nothing with it. I would kill for Scott. I will change it again if I get Scott. I'm telling you right now. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I wouldn't even think about it. Tom. If you got Tom, you would totally be Tom. I don't think so. No, there's too many Toms. That's the problem, Ryan. Yeah, but you'd be the Tom. That's the problem Ryan Block has because he's Ryan. Yeah. Because yeah. he got on Twitter early. Everyone thinks he's Ryan Seacrest. Ah. He gets all these at replies for <laughs> Ryan Seacrest because they're like, oh, it's Ryan at Ryan. And it's just annoying. So I'm, I'm kind of glad. That's funny. I didn't think about that. Tom is... Uh, yeah, but who would they think? The guy, see, the Facebook look, founder? The, the guy who's Tom says, don't be sad if I miss your at reply. It's flooded out by missed tweets to Tom's Felton, Cruz, and MySpace. <laughs> oh, man. Hold, please. Your hosting is very important to us. Please stay on the line. <laughs> You'll print your eye and out. And your producer you. will be with you shortly. Press one. Oh, Aww. look at his represent. We're both wearing the shirt. Look at that. <laughs> Tony, I'm, I'm proud. You guys That's called awesome, each other man. this morning, didn't you? <laughs> We got to get him out one of these I'm years. I'm wearing my red spectacular shirt. Are you? Yeah, totally. <laughs> That's awesome. That's why I like Tony. Okay. Well, there's other reasons too, but there's, <laughs> there's no other reason. Fifty little Hitlers. <laughs> <laughs>